En ik kijk in die camera. Yeah. Well, good evening to um, this first meeting of a series of three on ethics and technology. And I was invited here together with Rob Mudde, who's our Vice President Education uh, here at uh, TU Delft, um, to, um, to be guests and to um, discuss with you on um, ethics and technology. So uh, the other uh, uh, sessions will also be devoted to the topic of ethics and technology. And what do you do when two young students come to you and they, um, they ask you whether you want to be involved in collaborate on ethics and technology when you are, like I am, a professor of ethics and technology here at Delft. So, of course, it is it's great, my pleasure, and I will tell you uh, in a minute uh, something about our view here in Delft and my view on ethics and technology. Um, but before I do that, perhaps Rob, you can tell something about you and why you think this is an important topic from yeah. the point of view of the board of the, of the university. I, I can, Jeroen, thanks. Um, I was also invited by two of our students to, to join this. And as Vice President of Education, um, I think it's my role to be present here. But I also think from my personal belief that ethics and te technology should go hand in hand. It's crucial for what we do. We use the phrase uh, impact for a better society. And mm -hmm. as soon as you say better society, yep. you need to invoke ethics. You okay. need to think ethically. You need to start trying to understand what that means for technology and so on. So I'm very much interested in uh, the conversation that we will have. Uh. Great, good. So I think without further ado, I will tell you, give you a little bit of a, of an, of a tour d'horizon and also um, tell you something about the take that we have developed here in Delft on ethics and technology. And that is, I'm happy to say, also spreading. We're just uh, making a remark about what uh, Brussels is doing and perhaps there are some questions about that on the position of Europe. Um, uh, but also the Netherlands is, is quite good in this field. And um, um, I can say that uh, a lot of these, these ideas have been developed by my colleagues here in Delft and we've always been very much supported by the board. So without further ado, um, I will tell you something about it. So there is a lot to think about. Um, and um, so if you look at the incredible flood of books, and this just two recent books, you know, one on, uh, on uh, both on, on CRISPR-Cas and genetic engineering, one by Jennifer Doudna, and the other one by a uh, lawyer and an ethicist on CRISPR people, and how we are about to, um, to engineer and to re-engineer humanity. Um, so two recent books, uh, both recommended, um, both wonderful. This is the five, uh, uh, the next 500 years. Uh, there's a quote that is a little dropping off, but in any case, the gist of that quote is, uh, according to Christopher uh, Mason, is uh, it's our duty to engineer because if we want to survive, we need to, you know, to uh, to adjust ourselves to the new circumstances. Um, but. These things are also happening, it's, uh, the, and even the ethics of brain-computer interfaces is now discussed. It's, uh, it's, it's no longer science fiction, it's a, it's a serious research topic, and it's going really far. Uh, this is also something that is happening. I thought it would move around, but it, uh, it apparently does it well. You, if it moves, then you would see this guy coming in and kicking this robot dog, uh, <laughs> and the robot uh, dog uh, adjusting itself uh, uh, immediately. So that, that, is, that is interesting to see from a mechanical engineering and robotics point of view. But it also raises the question, can you kick? It looks really nasty, actually, when you see it move. <laughs> so you, can you do that? Um, and of course, we are also not on, only mm. re-engineering ourselves, we're also re-engineering the whole planet. And also here, we are working on the technology. And I know that the people the colleagues who are working on this are also asking these questions. Can we really do this? And uh, under which conditions can we do that? So it is booming. And Delft, I'm happy to say, uh, otherwise it would be difficult for me to, uh, to stay here. Uh, we are really kind of uh, putting our money where our mouth is. We're investing in, in, in this. Uh, so there are many places where we do this. Uh, at the end, I will show you where you can go for some more resources. Uh, but we're not the only ones, right? If you, I did, uh, a year ago, I did a little survey and I went to the uh, landing pages of big universities that we consider a little bit of our, you know, our field. 
but also our competitors in a sense. Uh, so University of Cambridge landing page, first thing you see when you go to uh, Cambridge University, it's about a better future, right? And it's uh, Jane Goodall. Um, and it's uh, Oxford is conserving wildlife, right? So this is what they, how they identify themselves and how they want to be identified by others. Um, or it is UC London, robotics that help everyone. Um, or it is Imperial College, it's fighting forest yeah. fires. Um, Berkeley, energy and inequality. Um, Duke University conserving the oceans. You see where we're going. Sydney, <laughs> even more bigger ambitions, dealing with the world's greatest challenges. That is how they want to be perceived. And that's also where they are uh, investing. I was reminded of a, uh, a, a quote from uh, an old philosopher, or now forget, uh, forgotten a little bit, Ortega y Gasset, Spanish philosopher of culture. He has a, a very nice essay on what is technology. Uh, he was not an engineer, but he is uh, a very smart and interesting thinker on technology, on kind of a philosophical consideration. He said, in order to be a good engineer, it's no longer enough or it's not good enough to be a good engineer. You need to be something more. And all of these pages already signaled that, right? So you, yep. you need to be a good engineer, but in addition, you have to be able to participate in these societal debates. Um, so, um, yeah, and you have to be able to reflect on these things also in your private life and in your professional career. So if your boss asks you to design dark patterns on the internet or optimize websites for addic addictiveness or, you know, work on defeat devices for uh, testing the, uh, the exhaustion fumes and the CO2 emissions of, of cars like Volkswagen uh, did, right? Or set up a, um, a lab to work on germline gene uh, editing in a country that uh, doesn't take the uh, regulations of, uh, of the WHO serious, would you do that? And, and how would you decide what kind of, have you been prepared and equipped to think about these things? Uh, would you take money from, you know, the, the director of the media lab stepped down because he took money, lots of it, from Jeffrey Epstein. You know, he had to go, he had to step down. So you have to be able to make your own judgment independently on a lot of these issues and the stakes are high. This is not just marginal stuff, right? And the Canadian engineers hand out when they are sworn in or they handed over their, their master degree, uh, an iron ring uh, to remind them of two huge construction mistakes that were made and p many people died. Uh, just to remind them of, you know, that you have to, you have an obligation to society and you have, have to take that obligation very serious. So, um, to be a good engineer is no longer good to be just an engineer. You have to do more and you have to be able to take part in the debates on these grand societal challenges. Uh, and there are many of them, of course. So there's no shortage of them. We used to call them the uh, UN Millennium Goals. Um, and um, later on, and now we call them the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so every country in the world subscribes to these 17 goals. And they are huge. They have to do with uh, affordable health care, to clean drinking water, etc. And um, even the UN, com uh, composed of a lot of international lawyers and diplomats and polit politicians, now realize that in order to get solutions to those UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, we have to deal with innovation and technology. Otherwise, we're not going to solve these problems. So technology is part of the solution and part of the problem. And uh, they have created a new mechanism. It's called the Technology Facilitation Mechanism. And every high-level meeting of the UN is now uh, preceded by you know, a congregation of people who are looking at technological and innovative solutions too. So it's no longer about you know, self-parking slippers. And this is a real example. There <laughs> apparently are self-parking slippers. Uh, you know, I can, come, I can give you many, many, uh, many examples of these kind of frivolous innovations. It's new. It's, it wasn't there before, before you thought of it. But it's not what we want, right? Can we please um, uh, aim at solving urgent and important problems before, uh, before one of us dies? And, and, uh, so, but how do we do ethics? No, so. um, uh, and we can take the lead from a remark by the architect of the privacy legislation in uh, Brussels, Paul Nimitz. He's the senior legal advisor. And he says, if we want to 
um, make sure that our Western democracies survive with the rule of law and the human rights and respect them, we have to shift gears. We have to do something different. It's, it's no longer good enough to talk for hours and hours and years and years about ethics. We have to do it. We have to put it in practice. So we have to do this by design. And this is the key term that I would like to explain something about. You have to remind me a little bit of the time, otherwise we uh, may be uh, going too uh, slow. Um, so first idea is we have, we have our values and we have to design for those values. If we take those values seriously, we will have to be serious about putting them in practice. That's the idea. Um, so two ideas are here. Design is value laden. Everything that is designed comes with the perception and the ideas that are baked into it by the maker, by the person who thinks about it. it probably can't help it even. Sometimes it is intentional, but sometimes it is just involuntary. And the second dimension of this is that your values are design consequential. If you are so big on privacy and you think that autonomy or responsibility is so important, I expect you to put that in practice when the opportunity arises, right? So that, that is what it means to take your values serious. You will not forego opportunities to make those values work. Now, in the 21st century, this means that you will always be keen to put them into your designs. So, um, and this is the example that I love you to remember, because once you've seen this, you will remember it forever, and you will see many, many examples of it. This is, I will give you the short story, something went wrong. This is a low-hanging bridge or, or overpass in uh, Brooklyn, New York. It's still there. And the story behind it is, and the one, the guys there on the left, uh, described this in a paper called, Do Artifacts Have Politics? And the answer is yes, they do have politics. They come with the values and the worldview of the person who designed it and thought about it. And the story behind this is, uh, is this. These are low-hanging overpasses because they were lower than what was usually built. But uh, from the uh, biography of the one who designed them, the architect, uh, we know that he was a little bit of a racist. And he designed these things intentionally low so as to prevent the buses from the poor black neighborhoods to be routed to the white middle class beaches. So this is a racist overpass, right? It is, was intentionally made low to express this idea of segregation. And uh, this happens everywhere, not necessarily racist ideas, but your ideas. They could be good, they could be bad, but it's for us to decide. We have to scrutinize those designs in light of the values that they may express. So if you don't want to chase people away from this bench, right, um, uh, and you can do hostile architecture, um, or you, uh, we know that there are biases in search engines. We know that there are biases in news feeds, in the algorithms that, that, um, that run in the, in, in the background. Uh, we know that we can m make light bulbs that could last for 100 years. This is a centennial light bulb in Chicago, bulb in Chicago um, except for some power outages. Uh, it has been burning for 100 years, but it's designed for contrived durability. Right? We, we, we contrive the, 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 the durability. And the same for planned obsolescence. These are the peaks in people who are searching online for why is my iPhone so slow? Well, there's a, a coincidence every time with the introduction of a new one, right? Uh, so <laughs> you figure it out. Uh, your websites could be designed for addiction. And this is an art. You can do your PhD in this, right? You can get a PhD in how to optimize sites to make them more addictive. Uh, you could design dark patterns on the internet. This is a roach motel. It's a kind of a, a fly bottle. Once you're in, it's very difficult to get out. You can set up your, your account in Facebook or Amazon, try to remove it. Much more difficult, you know? It's there in a, in a second, but uh, so that is, a, that is, a, that is a, a pattern that makes it more difficult. Um, so everything is designed and it comes with the values of the, of the designer. Now everything nowadays is designed, even our cities from A to Z are designed. So everywhere you look is a design decision by an architect, a town planner, uh, a, a computer uh, scientist, w whatever. So it's very much true what Churchill said. We shape our buildings, and thereafter our buildings shape us. 
right? And if we don't explicitly, systematically, accountably, continuously design for these values and try to be transparent of which values we have put in, others will do it for us inefficiently, secretly, haphazardly, and self-servingly, right? So this is our task. Values are built in, and this is an example in information systems. Those with you with kind of a digital or computer science background will recognize it. Every level, a complex system, you make choices. Some of them are value neutral or not are trivial. Some of them key to future users. But the system as it is presented to the user is the congealed or consolidated set of choices that have been made by programmers, engineers, architects, etc. So this is the structure of the problem, what we call value-sensitive design. On the left-hand side, you have your values, your principles, your norms, the ethical things, basically. And on the right-hand side, you have the world of engineering. And you want not the racist ideas to land in the low low-hanging overpass. You want your right values to be incorrectly expressed on the right-hand side, and you want to be able to justify and audit and show to the taxpayer that actually you have done a really good job on this. This is what we need to do, not once a year or once in 10 years. This is what we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? So this iterations uh, in a transparent mode, what, you, what your ideas were, why you did it in this way, and why do you thought this, this was the best thing. Now, this is what we have been working on here in, in Delft, designing for X, designing for your value where X ranges over a number of values. Pri it could be privacy, security, all of these things. You have to be able to, uh, to take them serious and put them into design. Um, and as, as I said, if you don't do it uh, with the right values in the right way, transparently, others will do it for you. So and this is what we do with students and, uh, and also with uh, outsiders, with people who come to us and say, help us with being ethical and designing things ethically, responsibly. You take your values, your moral values, as a kind of high-level supra-functional requirements, your non-functional requirements, and you break them down, specify them until you hit your design requirements. And so this is a way to convert. It's a cheap trick, you could say. You convert your, your ethical considerations into design requirements. And then, of course, all engineers are very happy. I hope you will recognize this. Once you have design requirements, that's good because you can really do something with it. And we do these value hierarchies with them. Privacy, what do you mean privacy? Well, risk mitigation, what do you mean risk mitigation? Well, coarse graining your data or data clustering or pseudonymization. Here you can, in a, in a, in a, in a tractable way, disagree. I can point my laser pointer to a place and I say we can have a debate about you know, the decomposition of these, of these uh, requirements. Uh, so this is what we do. Um, um, so there is some ethical homework to do for us. We need to sit down and do this, right? So here you have just an example from digital, the digital society. You have uh, on the left-hand side, you have all the, you know, the, 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 the technologies that you, you, you know by, because you're working yourself on them or you read about it in the newspapers. On the right-hand side, you have ethical values or issues or problems. Any combination probably gives you a nice uh, subject for a, for, a, for a bachelor's thesis, right? AI and human dignity, big data and privacy, deep learning, or, you know, uh, what is it, blockchain and sustainability. Who, who, who uh, could, could say that this would be such a big issue? Now, um, so what we see here is on the right hand side you see these kind of philosophical notions that we use to think about societies like property and democracy and friendship and community um, and we didn't know what they meant uh, but for a philosophical conversation that's no problem you just open another bottle of red wine and you have more of a philosophical dis debate uh, but if you have to design something and now we get into the the prefixes in the yellow are from taken from the digital domain and they're added to the stock list of philosophical notions. So suddenly we talk about cyber community, but we were lost what to spell out and to define what a community was. Now we are talking about a cyber community. We don't know what we're talking about. Friendship, what is a friendship? Uh, children come home and they say, I have a thousand friends. Really? Do you, what, what kind of definition of a friend do you have, right? So, so all of these, uh, but we, if you, and the problem is, um, uh, we're working in a vacuum because uh, cyber community means, yeah, well, it's a sort of community. It's not a village. 
Um, but it's something else. It looks like it, but it's, it's, it's online, it's virtual, you don't know each other, but still you're a community. Um, a digital democracy is a sort of democracy. So you're taking out a, a mortgage on a future definition or an analysis of these concepts that you still have to provide. Um, so you're working in a conceptual vacuum and therefore you're in a policy vacuum, and therefore you're in a design vacuum. How can you design a system if you don't know what you're talking about? So you have to make these things explicit along the lines that I just sketched you, kind of break down these values and give a kind of reconstruction of what you think should be the content of this, this idea. So here is a, a colleague from the US who has just figured out that there were over 20 definitions of algorithmic fairness, right? If you want your algorithms to be fair, that's great, that's wonderful, but in which sense? You have to carve out this idea for yourself and make it transparent and explain it to other people. So that's what we do, ethical homework plus exercises, right? Uh, and you can really put it into practice. You know, this is design against crime. Uh, and, and these correspond to whole bodies of knowledge. There is research, there are groups within architecture, industrial design working on these things. Design for activity, here you see you're designing for X, right? Um, designing against obesity and urban sprawl, e obesogenic en environment, design for refugees, uh, design for darkness, right? Um, design against terrorism. Uh, design for social cohesion, and even design for dignity. And so you think, designing for dignity, how would you do that? I can give you remarkable examples of how you could do that if you just sit down, because ethics is not about, oh, I'll give you the big spiel, the, the big story. No, you will have to do sit down together with your technical colleagues and specify what you mean in a particular uh, context. Um, but there is so much to do. Now I come to the last five minutes. Do I have more five more minutes? Yep, okay, good. Um, there is so much to do, which is already clear from all the examples I gave, right? There's this, our, our tragic condition is value pluralism. There is all of these values, and we cannot shop selectively in this, oh, well, you know, let's do human dignity next week or health uh, tomorrow or, you know, democracy today or a little bit later. No, you have to do all of these things at the same time. You cannot just pick and choose. All of these things are important. And therefore, you are bound to have conflicts and dilemmas between you can be, try to be very open, but that is at the expense of your privacy, of course. Or you can be very efficient, but that goes at the expense of your safety because that costs a lot of money. So you see these kind of conflicts and dilemmas arising now the, and so you're constantly overloaded you want to do you want to be such a good person that you are you, ha, you have a lot of uh, stuff on your plate on your moral plate now this at the same time it looks like you know a dire situation but at the same time it is very good news and I will show you why this is good news um, you want the, 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 the problem of moral overload is you want your prosperity and sustainability, security not or, security or privacy, you want both of these and preferably even more of those, right? Um, so this is the thing, uh, oh, oops, uh, I'll get, first give you an example of uh, a case where it um, uh, didn't work. You, you want to, this bus was optimized for sustainability, you know, light material, plastics, uh, aluminium, liquid gas. Oh, boom, right? This is uh, a couple of years ago near, near Wassenaar. And, uh, but you want, of course, a sustainable and safe bus and, and, and probably many more of those properties. Uh, here you have a positive example. You know, so this was uh, internationally a little bit of a hit. A green bus stop. There are now 300s over, all over Utrecht and people are very interested in this green bus stop. What does it do? It has a green um, covered, uh, plant covered roof. Uh, it has, on the right hand side, you see a list of all the things for which it was designed. And these are societally kind of interesting properties, right? It, it captures the run of water, it reduces the heat in the city, you know, it's a, it's a place for, for insects to come to, it's aesthetically pleasing, people feel safe, etc. So, and all realized in one design. So here you don't have even two things, but you have a whole shopping list of things that from a moral point of view are very interesting to have. The, de the designers managed to combine these all at the same time. Here you have another example. You know, this is the ethical, the fair phone. And the blue labels, you know, correspond to things that are from a moral or societal point 
very desirable. So you don't have to throw the thing away when, once one component is broken, you can just replace it. It has dual SIM, you don't have to have two phones, etc. So that, that's, that's very good to, to have. So six things realized in one design. That's the structure that we're getting at. Uh, this is the Delft foldable container. Um, so it satisfies all the requirements of the, 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 the normal uh, traditional container, but these ships are big polluters. 40% of the containers goes empty around the world. If you could have them like an Albert Hein cartier foldable uh, and uh, without having to, to, to change the dimensions of the Ks and the cranes and the ships, uh, so we may have the same infrastructure that in principle could lead to a huge um, uh, sa uh, savings from a point of view of, um, of emissions and therefore sustainability. So you, you expand the set of, of things that are desirable properties that were present in the traditional container, you expand it with one more, right? So in the design. Uh, here you see uh, this is uh, this is the uh, defense against the the North Sea, uh, and you you, you tuck away the um, the uh, the garage under underneath, and you make it part of the defense against the uh, the sea. So you you serve s safety, recreation, and the environment. Three things that you 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 want in one design. Uh, same thing here is an example from uh, mechanical engineering here, um, uh, Dutch and uh, uh, Delft colleague. So these people, I was very impressed by this story where they try to do um, by nano printed uh, hip prosthesis, try to combine three, um, uh, three properties uh, of uh, the, let's say, the stimulation of blood vessels, the stimulation of the growth of the, of the, uh, of the bone tissue, and killing the bacteria at the site of the, uh, so the, the, w the way this, this material is printed um, um, gives you those three, uh, and it really kind of lowers your statistics of mortality and complications after hip replacement operations, right? So this is, this is, this is really, um, this is where, where engineers are trying to push the moral envelope. By doing what? Well, this is the structure that has been underlying all of these examples. You have a number of values, and preferably your list is as long as you can get it, and your innovation is the smart solution that gives you all of these in one go. So your innovation is there not just to, you know, uh, get more money into the pockets of the, of the entrepreneur, uh, but it may do that at the same time, that's no problem. Uh, but it, it is there because you want to expand the set of obligations and responsibilities to society that you can do. Here's a good example, privacy by design. It's a European example and it's, and it's been a great success. It's there because we, right from the start, already 20, 30 years ago, and especially in Germany, we said privacy and data protection are very important. And it has given rise to a whole portfolio, to a whole industry of privacy-preserving technologies, where you can have the functionality of your IT without you know, damaging your privacy. You can have both. You can have both. That's the idea. So simple example, you want to count the number, you know, that's your functionality. You need to count the number of people in the room, but you don't want to disclose their identities. This coarse graining of the data allows you to do both. And this is just a simple example of very sophisticated mathematical techniques that are now used to do this, right? And we're, we're using them everywhere. Um, so designing new functionality that allows us to expand the set of obligations that we can satisfy. That's the hallmark of responsible innovation. That is what is expected, I think, of you as engineers when you take part and think about these grand challenges. Try to have those um, public values, the things that we all care about and we've said and agreed that we, that we care about them, put them in practice and make them part of your design and you will find that if you do this systematically and transparently and continuously and in an agile way, you will find that you miraculously will be able and pointed um, to interesting innovations that other people just may miss because they're not looking with those glasses, these ethical glasses to the world. So that's what I uh, wanted to say. This is the, my final statement. This is the principle of responsible innovation, I think. If you can change the world by innovation today so that you can satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today.
that's what I wanted to share with you. And, um, and we're open for questions, Rob and myself. So, oh yeah, and if you want more information, this is our Delft Design for Values Institute. Great story, very inspiring. Oh. And the uh, questions will probably pop in, uh, but, but well, came to mind to me is that you gave an excellent example why we use the phrase socially responsible engineering. Uh, it's, yes. it's, that's what we, t we try to train socially responsible engineers Yes. Uh, because of this, the, the underlying principles. And I think it makes engineering more interesting rather than it does not. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah the absolutely. The, the complexity uh, increases and uh, smart people like complexity. It's a great way of trying to that find your... That, uh, is, that uh, is also my experience. Yeah. When you explain it to students, they, they love the challenge. Yeah. They, they, they think, oh yeah, l let's stick, stick some more of those kind of yeah. requirements. Yeah, can, can yeah. we do? Yeah. Um, so let's see, what kind of questions do we have? Um, uh, I see a number of them appearing here. Uh, so one is, what do you think of the current practices of social media giants, the uh, big tech companies? Are they doing the right thing? Should they decide what can be said and what not? Oh, that's a difficult one. That's Rob. a difficult question. Um, what do you think? I, I don't have a concrete answer on that. Do they do the right things? They're probably developing it. Um, um, they probably also need some input from governments on what are the rules here. Uh, what I find intriguing is the question, uh, the, the second part, mm -hmm. do they decide what can be said? Yep. Um, on the one hand, no, no censorship. On the other hand, yes, not anything goes. Mm -hmm. So th th there need to be boundaries and there are partially responsible for their platform. Uh, so I see the struggle that they have. Um, and, and this has the aspect of openness, transparency. Um, uh, this is a lot of the values that you touched uh, mm -hmm. upon, uh, Jeroen. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, um, I think, um, I think you, you, you made that remark when we were having a conversation uh, before that, that also people like Mark Zuckerberg just just found themselves in this, this position when they started at their dorms yep. uh, to develop this. Uh, they, they really didn't um, anticipate that this would, would, would be the result. And, uh, and, and they were just, uh, you know, just bedazzled by all of everything exactly. around them. Yeah. And um, so, but th this is a steep learning curve, of course, for society. And you see now that, uh, especially in Europe and the rest of the world is, is looking a little bit uh, at Europe and how they are uh, you know, um, trying to come to grips with these, also with competition law and um, tax law, making them pay and making them responsible, and, and also uh, by regulation. So there's a lot of AI regulation that uh, and, and data protection regulation in Europe. Um, so the first is, of course, for, for, uh, the second is uh, for, firmly established, but AI regulation is, is going to be implemented soon. Um, and it will change the game, uh, I think, a little bit. Um, and also in competition law, I, I think the Americans are also looking at what Europe does. And it yep. was an item in the uh, presidential elections, of course. L uh, Elizabeth Warren was, uh, was quite strong on, uh, you know, uh, dusting the, uh, the Sherman Act and trying to see how they, um, they could have a go at those monopolies um, that, that we know are not, you know, uh, to our advantage. Um, so... This, this leads me to a, kind of a more general remark um, that, um, that the government uh, has, of course, um, n you know, always ha has ha had this kind of liberal or neoliberal um, uh, ideology about the market that would, would yeah. take care of things, right? So that's, I think that has now been more or less established to be Yeah, there is on, only a certain set of things that markets can take care yes, of. Exactly. Um, they have the disadvantage that they are in a competition, which makes it really tough mm. to be the first one changing the rules if that is not immediately beneficial to mm. what you did. Mm -hmm. And for that, a government is, uh, is needed. Um, but it also, it, there's also an obligation on us as consumers. We're also yes. part of this. Mm -hmm. Companies, whatever you think of them, but they tend to try to do what customers 
um, are buying. And if we don't buy it, they will probably change. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, so there's, um, uh, let me see, um, are there other, should cookies be illegal? Um, no, I don't no. No. think so, um, but it, I think we should have some, as we now have, we should, we should have some regulation about, uh, you know, under which conditions they, they are used so that it's, uh, and I gave the example of these, these, these dark patterns where you can switch them on and off and, and the infrastructure is trustworthy. So if I, if I want to, you know, uh, uh, neutralize them, I should be able to do that fairly simply. Uh, but I could also use them, want to use them to my advantage, right? So that's... Um, um, how, how about because they use cookies and, 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 and try and, and get my data uh, to turn that into a form of business? Would it be fair to you, Jeroen, if I could switch cookies on, but I won't have the full package of advantages because I'm not paying? Mm -hmm. If I switch on the cookies, I agree that my data can be used mm -hmm. and it can offer me more service. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now you see these alternative business models being, being explored where, you know, people, also consumers are now becoming and users are becoming aware of the fact that their data is uh, value, you know, is worth something, and uh, so you're exchanging. Uh, an exchange that already took place, for example, in Albert Heijn, uh, you, you, you gave information about what you bought on Friday evening, and in exchange you got, you know, a discount, or some, some miles, or whatever. Uh, so, if you knew what the conditions were yeah. for the use, or the secondary use, then that would be a fair deal, you know, it's a quid pro quo. You could you could enter into that, but it is all is built on the assumption that it that it's um, that there's a contract that is fair. And you get a fair price, a fair discount, uh, and that the um, the one who gets the and collects the data uh, sticks to the terms of the contract. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why we have these uh, these data uh, data protection regimes in in place. Um, let me see. Uh, in what current technology do you think ethical aspects should be weighed the heaviest? Is there is there a technology that you really kind of lose sleep over, Rob? Yeah, that's the ones that make the news, but. If I read the sentence, I'm not sure whether I'm, and I think about it, willing to make a longer list uh, for, for a reason that I don't oversee for all the technology that you could list, what the potential impact could be. I think you just made a plea that it holds for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, and weighing some over the others uh -huh. doesn't seem like a, like a good starting point. Mm -hmm. I would say everybody involved in developing and using technology should always keep in mind what the ethical aspects are. And in some cases they may be mild, and in some cases they may be huge. Mm -hmm. But if you make a list, <coughs> you, know, you usually end up with that the top five gets all the attention and the others say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. tomorrow. How the others fall in your tomorrow category? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, w one thing I I think AI is 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 special because it's su such a general or kind of even a meta uh, master technology that is that's going to be used in many other technologies or in devices and it's it's uh, inconspicuous. You, it may be present everywhere, um, and it may be biased and it may. Uh, it may be used to manipulate people, and Absolutely. as we've seen on online, you know, you may you may end up in a filter bubble, or you're you may be targeted by personalized messages that people have found out about you know, how vulnerable you are, or you know, likely you are to change your mind as a result of which inputs, etc. So I think, um, and I've referred to that as the the Bermuda Triangle of big data, <laughs> big data, advanced psychology, and AI. So if you if you really have those three, 
uh, then that gives may give rise to you know an unprecedented power and a, and, and a power to manipulate people, as we've seen in the Cambridge mm -hmm. Analytica uh, yeah, case, yeah. of course, and still under investigation. Which role these kind of data brokers and these analytical companies played in in helping politicians to to success, and it's just a matter of investing, right? If you if, if you're a Russian oligarch and you can spend a couple of millions, you can buy botnets. Uh, uh, and you can make true, them Twitter true, true. and send yeah. messages around and influence yeah. people, etc. So that is, I think, uh, a, of a real concern to um, to uh, to to uh, Western democracies, as we uh, we said. Another thing is, is the use of AI, for example, for you know life and death decisions, where um, where where machine learning or deep learning. Is uh, is used to, to to make those decisions, or at least help human beings yeah. make those decisions, right? Um, that is that it's complicated in the sense that um, the system can only assist in a sense, uh, so a human will uh, always be held responsible, accountable. Uh, but at what point can't you make any other decision than what the machine tells exactly, you? Exactly, exactly right. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, out of your league, mm -hmm. and that becomes. Yeah, I don't think I want to move into into such a world, even though it has promises of better decisions, but I find mm. the consequences really far going. Yeah, yeah. No longer accountability for uh, for systems uh, and decisions. Yeah. It should rest with humans. Yeah. So in Delft, we have for the viewers who are maybe interested in this uh, this topic is this uh <coughs> we have an initiative, uh, campus wide AI initiative. We started this a couple of years ago. Um, Thanks to the board. Uh, so, and the topic there is um, is meaningful human control. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we're designing for autonomy. We want these technologies to be autonomous, but then we still want them also to be. We, we don't want that to go to a, to the expense at the expense of human responsibility. Exactly. Right. So yeah. if something goes wrong, we need to be able to go to someone and and ask, you know, why did this happen? Can we prevent this in the future, etc. So, what's what, your story? What, yeah, yeah. What is what is your objection against going to the machine of the future and holding that accountable? Um, well, that is a, a very good question, uh, and um, uh, my, my answer would would be that we have tried that and it doesn't work. Um, in the past, um, in um, Athens, 400 BC, you had a special court, and you could take uh, an item that had fallen on someone's head, um, killed or injured someone. You could take it to court, and you could have it. You could have it, uh, you know, sentenced, or destroyed, or damaged. Uh, and in the Middle Ages, and even until 1800, we had courts across Europe, and this was not an incident. We had tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases against animals, right? Mm -hmm. So animal trials. So if your donkey kicked you or the, the dog bit you or your, your locusts uh, ate your, 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 uh, your stuff, then you could take them to court. We stopped this whole thing because it doesn't make any sense to hold objects or animals responsible. The only thing that you s uh, it makes sense to hold responsible is human beings. And um, so even if these items, artifacts, become um, outrageously um, you know, smart, uh, I think it, it is just not what we can, uh, what we can um, sensibly do uh, unless we, we change, radically change our practices. But I, I, don't, I, just, I have difficulty picturing to my mind's eye what it would mean to um, to hold um, uh, a piece of software that may be on your USB stick, you know, <laughs> accountable, right? Yeah. So yeah, I find I, it I difficult as well. But trample it, or kind of stand on it, or uh -uh. put it in a glass of water, or you know. So I, I it, it just comes, becomes make sense. more difficult if it starts talking back, and if you have a sense that it <coughs> has emotion. But then you're at the level, kind of, as yes. I'm responsible for my dog. I don't have one, but I'm responsible yeah. if I would have one. Yeah. Even though the dog can kind of talk back, has emotions, mm -hmm. has an understanding that it shouldn't bite you when it did. Yeah. Still, we say the owner is responsible, no matter what the dog does. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so I um, so, so sometimes you, uh, you you get in a conversation and people want to push this to the extreme and they say, well, what if it if it had emotions, right? So then, yeah, but but if it but it it it, it really doesn't have any subtle thoughts or it cannot reflect on morality. Yeah, but even if it if it would have a morality, if it would stick to certain rules, etc. Um, yeah, but then it wouldn't have a life. It, 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 it doesn't have a human life. It wasn't born. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't realize that it's going to die or that it could get ill, <laughs> right? Or what it is to, uh, to be. Yeah, I mean, purely intellectually, it could do that. But, uh, but it, it couldn't live that experience. So it would always be very different from a human being mm. who realized that, yeah, there is someone suffering and I could be in that position. And perhaps it's also our shortcoming that I simply cannot replace myself in the dog. I have difficulties understanding, trying to see what a dog yes. is. Yes, uh, I, I think in the case of a dog, that, that would really help a little bit, yeah. For example, <laughs> there are some serious, there are some serious um, uh, uh, scientists, uh, Frans de Baal, the uh, primatologist, who has uh, argued that, um, that it, it really is a shortcoming of a lot of those animal studies that they they don't want to anthropomorphize. Right? Mm -hmm. He said, you, you, you should do that a little bit, right? So you should look at the chimpanzee as having grief or, or mourning yeah, of, or of a, and, and, and it, it gives you, from a methodological point of view, gives you a good stance of trying to better understand and describe the behavior of the animal. So it's, um, so he's arguing for that. Let me see other, how do you think the Dutch government acted during the pandemic, especially enforcing a cur curfew Rob, I, I think uh, I think this is something for you. <laughs> well, given the the chaotic state where we find ourselves back, given that it's the first time for virtually everybody that we're in such a pandemic, I don't think anybody in the West, in our part of the world, has really felt the pandemic. The last one serious enough was a little over 100 years ago. Um, curfew is that bad. I think it's, yeah, what can you expect? Uh, I, I liked the phrase of Rutte uh, uh, maneuvering in the mist, in the fog. Yeah. I think that's what he did. Yeah. And looking back, probably we will find out that quite a few things could have been done differently, some of them better. But you see so no big, big kind mm. of mistakes? No, I've got, mm. yeah, I, I, tr I trust them. I, I trust the politicians in that point. I trust the outbreak management team that they use the knowledge that they have and that they act on ethical grounds. Mm. As soon as you mistrust that, then the answer is going to be negative. Yeah, of course. But I don't, I don't distrust them. Yeah. 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 Did, did we like it? I don't think so. No. Most people didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. It was not really the question. Yeah. No. So there's a question, do you both think that we are in a value transition and entering a sort of new hippie age with focus on equal rights, veganism becoming more popular, drugs seem to be accepted more widely? A new hippie age, well, uh, let's focus on the value transition. Do we see a kind of value transition towards more ethics? Do you think do you I see think that around I you? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think that... that more and more people come to the realization that business as usual um, is, is going to uh, jeopardize what we do, is going to decrease the standard of living of many, mm -hmm. and is just not sustainable. And that's, I think, worrying many people. Is that a hippie age? I don't think so. I think that most people are going to feel this and that the, the value shift away from um, short notice to somewhat longer terms to make it sustainable. Yeah. Um, and I think it's timingly, because we're running out of time, and it's, I think it's also understandable that it took quite a bit. Because I recall my mother, um, who came from a poor background, she looked really different at modern developments. Mm -hmm. For her, having light in a house was fantastic. Mm -hmm. She probably never thought about an energy transition. She, she passed away, so I can easily say that. Um, but but in current times, we I think we are seeing now that um, that some of our core values are in danger, and that's what I think makes the transition for many people much more feelable and mm -hmm. close. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so too. I, I think I see this, this, this transition or this, um, this move, movement um, gradually taking place. I, I just can, from my own personal point of view, I can just compare how I started 30 years ago with ethics. You know, it was, it was, a, it was very tough to sell. You know, people just were not interested. I can imagine. Uh, and yeah. especially people from industry or, or managers, when you yeah. were talking to them, they were actually not like, ah, oh, they, they, they liked you because, you know, it's such a sympathetic, you know, message. But, you know, it, we, we can't really, you know, take it, take it serious. And now it's completely the opposite. Uh, no. yeah, completely I can imagine strange. that it used to be for philosophers, nice to dream about a good world, yes. but uh, not for yeah. the real world. No, not for the real world. Yeah, and that has changed. Yeah. It really has changed. Yeah, and uh, so it, it is a boardroom kind of uh, concern, also because you know the you know the, the the perception, the public perception is is such. There's a lot of transparency, and um, uh, when you make a wrong move, it will be uh, you know all over the internet and in in the media, and it will cost you dearly. And people realize that trust is almost never in your Excel sheet, right? In your spreadsheet. <laughs> but you know, once it's gone, you know how expensive yep. it was, uh, right? Uh, so that, uh, so that, and trust is a moral is a moral phenomenon. You know, you said you, I trust them. I think they are always trying to do the best thing. That's what trust is. Yep. You trust yep. someone, and that means that you you assume that that person is acting from a moral point of view. Um, so. And this leads to the, another question that is here. Uh, this is all different regions. Why are values so different in regions around the world and how should global companies deal with this? Um, yeah, just uh, as, a, as a bridge between the, the, the last question and this one. Um, so I see the move in, in Western liberal democracies, basically, in Western Europe and, and you know, our, our, the coalition of the morally willing. So there's Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Um, and also to a certain extent uh, the US. But if you look at, at China, for example, that, that, is, that is completely different, right? So we see uh, many, we see a lot of backsliding of democracy yeah. uh, yeah. around the world. We see a lot of strong men uh, coming up and, and uh, um, moving in the direction of autocracies, of dictatorships, um, without rule of law, without respect for human rights, without democracy. So, um, and there we see uh, quite the opposite. So the question is, you know, uh, can the center hold? Can, can, can the Western uh, liberal democracy model uh, hold? And can it be productive and can it be prosperous? So that's, that's the reason why I, I keep emphasizing, I give those examples of innovation because we have to make our ethics work. We, can, we cannot just endlessly repeat our ethics uh, and, and let, it, let, let our society slip. Right, so we, we have to do the one and uh, the and other. In, in the question, I'm not so sure whether the underlying values are really different around the world. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. I think that the um, trust, friendship, um, don't do harm to your... Uh, to, to, innocent, to, innocent yeah, to innocent people and mm -hmm. so on. I think those are core values. That they materialize in different ways might be um, coming from whether you are an I or a we society, mm -hmm. that shifts them a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the tendency in, in many parts of the world to uh, dictatorship has very little to do with the underlying values of the people, I mm -hmm. would say. Mm -hmm. Most don't like it. Exactly um, right, exactly right. Yeah, And, th and that's, that's the reason why many assume that, that these arrangements, political arrangements, are socially unstable because you, you can fool some people some of the time and not put all people all of the time. Unless via <laughs> technology they get a grip yep. on it. Yes, that that is there's true. a danger. That is well, true. Well. That is true. Yeah, so values are, and I agree with, with Wolp there, that that's, uh, the, the core values are the same. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to sustain a minim, minimal social group. Yep. Um, so if you, if you, if you, if you, if the trans, you cannot trust anyone because they're all just do what they like. Um, then your transaction and, and information costs, they are so high that in every encounter with another human being, you would be completely you know, paranoid and, and, exactly. and you, you wouldn't have any peace of mind. Huh. So, so a couple of those core values um, are, are the same everywhere. The, these are truly universal, and, uh, uh, but the way they manifest themselves because of the local differences, the culture, the history, etc. 
uh, the landscape and the, um, the climate, etc. You see a lot of surface uh, variation. But deep down, uh, there are uh, some core values. Of course, that is the promise uh, for um, a new international global order. So although there's a lot of uh, rivalry, and the European Commission has called them, like China and Russia, uh, systems rivals, right? These are s systemic rivals. So they have a different political system. They have a different uh, idea of um, uh, of industry politics or of you know uh, uh, financial managing the financial system. But um, as it turns out, uh, digital technologies are very important for those systems to be coherent. Yep. Uh, because you, you, you cannot expect uh, the Chinese currency to be the reserve, new reserve currency uh, and build you know, a, a huge military apparatus um, and have the best universities in the world without digital infrastructure. So that holds the, everything together and therefore you see a lot of uh, ideological and ethical debate with respect to the governance of these advanced digital technologies. Uh, so China wants to have a firm grip on that debate because it wants to set the standards, yep. right? Yep. So that, that's, that's what you see. This is the reason why Europe was wise to make the first move in the governance and regulation of artificial intelligence, I think, um, and because they can set global standards by means of European law. And, and that's what they're doing right and now. And it really fits with our European culture. Yes, yeah. yes. I think yeah. that Europe should, could and should be leading in this. Yeah. 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 Um, what is the most important value to you and why? Um, yeah, I hope you already said that, that, that uh, I think correctly, that, that, and also m made a remark that you, you cannot shop selectively from all of these. Um, it, it also depends a lot of on, on, on context. What we can say is, is that these European values or Human, human rights systems or the whole yeah. uh, is based on human dignity. So that, uh, that, that is always assumed, which is a very puzzling notion because if you, if you want to explain what human dignity is, that's, that's very hard. Uh, we, we recognize it when it fails or when it's not respected. So it, when, when it goes against human dignity, then you see, you see that, that is, people are not giving a dignified treatment. Um, uh, but yeah, that must be very deep in our blu blueprint because everybody feels it almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that's probably why it's so difficult to uh, to give it a definition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's very, very basic. Yeah. So and and dignity comes with you know respecting an individual um, as uh, as unique uh, and and it. And as With something value cannot, in itself. Yeah, in itself. So an intrinsic value that cannot be exchanged. So, no. you know, yeah. oh, yeah, you're, you're, well, you're my friend or you're my wife or you're this person. You know, someone with the same properties could also do, right? You know, so that, that's, that's not the way it, it works. And so we see, um, we see individuals as, uh, as unique but also as infinitely rich. Because if they would be limited in their resources, they could be exchanged by some by something else that had the same you know set of properties, and so it's um, yeah that that's that that's at least an aspect of um, of uh, of human dignity. Um, let me see. Oh, Bitcoin here. <laughs> Do you think that Bitcoin will indeed make a fairer economic system worldwide, since banks cannot intervene anymore? My answer is no. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. No. Um, <coughs> because I think that the Bitcoin or the dollar, whatever you want to use, is not the problem. It's what people do with it. It goes back to ethical behavior. Mm -hmm. It's just a means. Yeah. Yeah, I also don't think that um, um, the way it's put here uh, is, is the solution. I do think that... Um, <coughs> You know, these peer-to-peer um, systems uh, uh, will allow us to uh, arrange our societies, not globally, uh, but, but locally, in different ways um, that would be superior to, like, say, top-down or centralistic governed uh, kind of systems. Especially yeah, with complex adaptive systems, you, you know, like traffic control, you can show that 
that these kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, these kind of yeah. uh, mm -hmm. self-organizing solutions are where you keep the information local uh, is, is superior to, I think that has been shown. Um, and um, yeah, these could also be more equal, so, um, so more egalitarian. So I think there's a lot of, we have a, uh, again, here in Delft, a very good group uh, on, on this, uh, Johan Pauls and his uh, 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 blockchain, uh, blockchain lab. Um, I think very interesting experiments going on and also involved in practical solutions for the government. So they're, they're looking at, uh, at uh, passports and identity yeah, um, uh, documents. Yep. I have another reason why I doubt that you can say that with such a new thing as a Bitcoin. It reminds me of that in the beginning of the internet, we thought that everything would be open, transparent and available for everybody. Did not quite materialize. No, indeed, no. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that was also the conclusion by, by the, um, the, the, the father, the founding father um, of the World Wide Web, uh, yep. Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, who started up his own business recently, uh, and his business is about uh, what he calls re-decentralizing the web, because the web started as something really decentral, uh, with um, on the basis of, of uh, e uh, equality, yep. um, and now it has been, you know, the powers have grasped the the, the power and has been centralized. So it was it has gone in the opposite direction of what he had in mind when he started this whole thing. And yeah, and on the other side is the dark web. Yes. That people yeah. started building, yeah. where we lose all control. Where, yeah. That is, mm. uh, yeah. So I think we had a, a nice uh, chat. Oh, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, for, thanks, everyone. For, 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 for this. And um, thanks for the organizers. And uh, good luck with the, um, with the next uh, couple of meetings. Uh, you have to start somewhere. And um, th this was it. So thanks very much. And thanks for... Um, being with us. Bye-bye.